Welcome back to Key Point here on TV3. We're live on 3FM 92.7, also on TV3 Ghana on Facebook and DSTV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Now, this week, we witnessed a decision by the Supreme Court after what ev eventually we got to know was an application for an expedited hearing by the Attorney General, Godfrey Diabo uh, for the case of Nelson Roxon Dafia Mekpo against the approval of these ministerial nominees who had gone through vetting by parliament. That case was dismissed unanimously. Prior to the hearing of this case at the Supreme Court earlier in the week, the NDC had raised concerns about the scheduling of cases, reason why they believe that the Chief Justice is not serving justice because of this particular case in question. Eventually, a decision was taken. After the court ruling on that day, the Attorney General spoke to journalists and gave a few pointers and some, some revelations as to why this case was called Elia or had earlier than other cases that had been filed, specifically the Dr. Amanda Odoi and Richard Delaskai cases. Take a look at the Attorney General. If we file an application in the Supreme Court of Ghana, it takes even three months for you to have a date for hearing. It is only after a party has made an application for an expeditious determination of the, of the process that the matter will come up for hearing. And indeed, in, in the record, we show that this particular case, for the record, it must be indicated that I specifically applied for an expeditious determination of the, of the matter. I applied for an expedited hearing of the application. Back in the days, if we file an application in the Supreme Court of Ghana, it takes even three months for you to have a date for hearing. It is only after a party has made an application for an expeditious determination of the, of the process that the matter will come up for hearing. And indeed, in, in the record, we show that this particular case, for the record, it must be indicated that I specifically applied for an expeditious determination of the, of the matter. I applied for an expedited hearing of the application. Well, so that's the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Godfrey Diaboa Dami, uh, there, giving that pointer of what he did and reason why this case was called. It was a question that was put to him as to why, in the case of Richard Sky and also Amanda Odoi, he did not or he was not minded to also apply for expedited hearing. That particular issue became an issue of reference when he gave the response that he is not a plaintiff in this case as well. Now, as to whether the other party in the case, in the case of Nelson Ross and Daphne McPaul, was served a notice of this expedited hearing or application, for that matter, by the Attorney General, is another conversation altogether. Recall that Nelson Rocks and Dafia McPost lawyers were not in court. And they explained why. And we're going to play that explanation to you, as given by Nick Papo Samoa Ado, who is the lawyer for Nelson Rocks and Dafia McPost. And what happened when the court bailiff went to his chambers? We got a CCTV video of that particular incident. So we would have a conversation on that and understand the processes that goes into the application of expedited hearing in our Supreme Court and what processes are employed. So we would have a conversation on that this morning. I've been joined in studio by Professor Enoch Enchi, who is a governance and 
policy analyst. He's the dean of the School of Business at the Academic City University and an author as well. And this week he's launched his book, which I was there to, to witness. We'll have a brief one on it as we go. Professor Enokinchi, good morning, welcome. Good morning, Alfred, and I'm thrilled to be here uh, to share knowledge and wisdom with your audience. Love you. Also joining us is the Boko Central Member of Parliament. He's a private legal practitioner and also a member of a number of committees in Parliament. He's held a number of ministerial portfolios in this country. The Honorable Mama Yaraga is our guest. Honorable Mama Yaraga, good morning, welcome. Good morning, good morning. Good morning to your viewers and listeners. And thank you very much for making the time to also join us here on Key Point. Professor Ransford Jampo is a professor of political science at the University of Ghana, Legon. Professor Ransford Jampo is joining us as well, and an author as well. Let me just put it on record. Professor Ransford Jampo, good morning. Welcome. Morning, morning, morning. Thanks, thanks for having me here. Why do you always make me sit close to you? <laughs> it is not my doing. It is the doing of the people who put us together. Also joining us is private legal practitioner, lawyer Kingsley Amwakon Buidu, who is a member of the New Patriotic Party. He's also a private legal practitioner. Council, good morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Kinsley Amwakwa. Amwakwa. I guess that's the reason why he jumped over me. Amwakwa. Yes. Because that's the reason why he jumped over me. Indeed. <laughs> welcome. He wasn't sure. Indeed. Amwakwa. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. This is and, your. And, and good morning to viewers, listeners, and my fellow panelists. That's right. And uh, I think this is your, your first engagement with us here on Key Point. It is so. Welcome. Yes, also joining us. On Zoom later is uh, Professor Bafo Ajimendia, who is a former United Nations advisor on governance. He's a governance who's going to be joining us as well. And uh, we have lawyer Bobby Banson, who is also a private legal practitioner. He's a lecturer at the uh, Ghana School of Law, what you popularly call Makola. He'll be joining us as well. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making the time to be here. Happy Easter to you all is in order, and taking the time to be here with us at a time like this is really appreciated. Thank you so much. Now, let me start off with you, um, P Professor Enokenchi. I mean, following the happenings uh, in court, and you do know it is as a result of that that this Nelson Rock interference court case that the Speaker of Parliament held on to the, the approval the parliamentary approval of ministerial nominees, which is in limbo. We'll find out what's going to happen next after this decision by the Supreme Court. But what's striking is that in court, the lawyers for the speaker agreed with the, with the attorney general's argument. This case was thrown out eventually, but the NDC had concerns. What's your take on, on how things played out this week? Thank you once again, Alfred. I think that peace is more precious than perfection. So we have our constitution, and the constitution is clear about separation of powers and rule of law. When we come to our constitution, the mandates, in fact, power actually belongs to the people, but functions of, you know, are divided into the three arms of government. So we have the executive, which have their function. We have the legislature, and then we have the judiciary. We know that laws are made by parliament. So the speaker, in most places like in America, the speaker is the law. They make the law. Now, when they make the law, which is a bill, it goes to the president to assent to it, it becomes a law. And then anytime there's a dispute, we have the judiciary that interprets that law. So the functions are very clear out there. I think that that is the beauty of democracy. What the speaker did was right to say that we sent ours, our bill, to the president to sign. And I've said it here a couple of times that values are priceless. There's nothing that you can exchange values for. 
So what is happening now is that we have a tussle between the law and reasoning and processes and then applications. In the end, the people suffer because we have some ministers to approve so that they can begin to work. We also have a bill that should be on the desk of the president to append his signature so that it becomes a law. All this should be done, but it should be done in the interest of Ghanaians. So the question here is, what do Ghanaians want? I think that Ghanaians want the president to sign that bill to become a law so that our values as a sovereign nation will be protected. In the same way, we also expect parliament to make sure that they approve these ministers so that they can begin to work. Because as at now, they are not working and government business is lying idle. You see, and uh, taking in consideration that particular issue you raise as well, as we speak, a decision has to be taken. Members of parliament have to be recalled. But as you're talking about this bill also being, being passed, the anti-LGBTQ plus bill, which is the foundation for all what is happening now. Yes. Uh, the president is making reference to a number of cases, or that is the attorney general's advice to him. There's a number of cases in court, reason why he should tarry a while in, in signing on to this. Yes, you see, the problem is that, that there's something called equalization. The Constitution is very clear. You know, I know law is a very authoritative language, but it's very clear that when we say separation of powers, it means that the powers are equal. I, I have say, said here that if you look at the U.S. Constitution, where I stayed for over 20 years, the, the proponents of U.S. Constitution, the original Constitution that we copied from, is saying that the founding fathers believed that the executive could be more powerful than the other ones, as we are practicing here. But the weakest link there is the judiciary. Why? Because any time parliament is making law, but we want the judiciary to come and interpret the laws the way they deem fit. I believe that Nelson's case, according to what we are hearing and what we've seen from the newspapers and everything going on, Nelson's case was sent two clear weeks before this issue came out. So we have a bill in front of the president. The president have not signed it. We saw the Ministry of Finance saying that they could lose $3.8 billion when the president signed that bill. So people thought that our democracy, our sovereignty is being influenced by other cultures. So it all boils down to values. What is our values? Do we as a people want to talk about sexual orientation and then we look at the process that parliament have gone through to make sure that this becomes a bill that the president should append his signature to, or the president will decide not to sign. In fact, we have a dilemma here, and this is an ethical dilemma that we all have to pass. Yes, like I said, I'm going to repeat it. The president should append his signature to that bill to become a law because that is the values. So sexual, ori sexual orientation, you know, is not a right. It's a privilege. And when we come to scholarly work, there's a difference between privileges and rights. So when somebody is a pedophile, you know, he aligns to that is the way he wants to. He wants to sleep with kids. But the law will prevent that person that you cannot do that. Because the lowest bar in our society, the values that we have, is against that practice. And that is why even in the U.S., when you go to jail for child pornography or anything, you are not allowed to stay close to five miles to any school. Because that is their values. So if any country loses their values, then you are lost. And that is why it is important for us to uphold to our values, especially when Parliament have all agreed bipartisan bill to this, that all that the president needed to do was to sign. But unfortunately, if you look at what is going on, Parliament is not speaking with one voice because most of them want to please the president. That is not how it's supposed to be. Because once you become a parliament, and here we go to our constitution, which is creating that problem. I propose that parliamentarians should not be selected to be part of the executive as ministers because now everybody is trying to catch the eye of the president instead of the eye of the speaker. Oh, and uh, that constitutional review process is one that Professor Jampo has been on for, for quite a while now. And there are recommendations to cure this sickness that you have just made reference to. But we are here after spending so much money going through that constitutional review process. The commitment to implement these recommendations is one that also is in limbo now. But this is what the, the concerns of the NDC are. 
earlier in the week, even before this court case, uh, the, the hearing of this case at the Supreme Court, the NDC raised these concerns. And you take a look at this. One, they say that this decision by the court, the Supreme Court, to hear the Nelson Rock and the Fiamma Court case was employed by the Chief Justice to fast track the determination of the Daffy McCoy suit while determination of the Richard Sky suit is deliberately and unduly delayed to enable the President shelve the anti-LGBTQ plus bill. They continue that arbitrary exercise of administrative discretion by the Chief Justice, particularly in shuttling of cases in the Supreme Court, goes to fortify the high perception of bias on the part of the judiciary. Such judicial manipulations go to confirm growing public perception that the current Chief Justice is a pliant accomplice and arbiter of the misrule of the despotic Ekufuado Baumia MPP government. There can be no earthly justification for listing the Dafia Mepo case ahead of the Richie Sky case, and they demand an immediate rectification of this travesty. It says there cannot be any earthly justification for this, what happened this week. Well, the justification or explanation to this, as given by the Attorney General, was that he applied for an expedited hearing. What we got to know, and I'll come to you on this point, Honorable uh, Mayaga, that w w what is the, the, the standard procedure if, if you want an expedited hearing? Because in what we have observed, at least in the recent past and, and what's happening now, is that in the case of Nelson Rocks and Film Court, was there any return date given for this, this particular suit that he applied for or filed at the Supreme Court? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, once again, good morning to viewers and colleagues on the panel. Uh, we can go into legal niceties and etc. But I think that it is important to appreciate the broader context of what is happening. It is essentially a standoff between the executive arm of government and the legislative arm of government in which both sides are maneuvering to achieve their objectives. And in the maneuver, they are both exploiting the opportunities available in the use of the judiciary as an arbiter and the manager of disputes between the two arms of government as stipulated by the Constitution. And so essentially, it is a political tussle, not really, in my opinion, a fine legal mm. issue, if you ask me. For instance, the question you asked, generally it is the practice that when you initiate an action in the Supreme Court, there are timelines within which certain steps must be taken. But at the same time, an interested party can seek to rush the court by requesting that the court undertakes an expedited hearing of his or her case if the exigencies dictate that. And the decision to expedite hearing of a matter is purely an administrative matter uh, that the Chief Justice will have to determine and take a decision on. In all sincerity and honesty, I honestly will not fault the Chief Justice or the Supreme Court in this matter. And I'm happy that the Speaker's lawyers have also taken the step that the Attorney General took, which is also right to the 
the, the, the yes. Chief Justice mm -hmm. and also demand expedited hearing of uh, their case. It is the reaction of the Chief Justice yeah. in this instance that will determine whether the Chief Justice is biased or not. She's been given the opportunity mm. to determine whether or not she will act in a biased manner or not. So I will not rush in passing judgment about the conduct of the Chief Justice because the Attorney General has a good defense, which is, look, you brought an action against me and... I feel I need to have the matter heard expeditiously. So I've written to the Chief Justice. There's a debate among the lawyers as to whether or not when the Attorney General writes to the Chief Justice demanding expedited hearing of a matter in which he is involved, mm -hmm. he should copy the lawyers on the, in, other, on side the other side or mm -hmm. not. In fact, I, I, I don't think that is legally mandatory. Really? Because, because that, writing... that was one of the major arguments yes, of, it, uh, it, of uh, the, the likes of uh, Edujita Maglo when I spoke to him within the week, that in, in the, the rules of court allow for this, this uh, expedited hearing. But what you do is that you file a formal application and that would enable the other party to be duly served. Then the parties appear before maybe a judge or a panel of judges sees with the jurisdiction to, to hear the matter. And they will not determine or not whether this application of the uh, the expedited hearing should be granted, and, and the no, other but, party but should be duly notified that so is, they know. That is when there is a return date. That is when a date has been fixed mm -hmm. to hear the matter. And if you now seek expedited, you know, hearing of the matter, it means that you want to abridge time. You want mm -hmm. an early hearing, and the other side has already been notified that the case is going to be heard on the twenty fifth. You want it to, have to be heard on the 12th. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, it is only fair and proper that it is an application and that the other side who is sitting and aware that the case is going to be heard on the 25th mm -hmm. must be given notice. And in this case, according in this to case, the lawyers... A date, was not fixed. Okay. a date was not fixed for hearing. He had filed it and then he had 14 days mm -hmm. to file his statement of case. He had not yet filed a statement of case. Yes. In the substantive writ, he had asked for an interlocutory injunction, uh, injunction which normally would be followed by a motion for uh, an interlocutory injunction. He hadn't done that uh, yet. And so, you know, there is an argument against why the court will rush and have expedited hearing of the matter when they haven't even benefited from seeing the arguments in the statement of case. Mm. There's a case for making that argument. Right. That if you had probably waited to see the arguments, to read the arguments in the statement of case, because your statement of case essentially contains your, your legal arguments. Mm -hmm. So if, if you had waited and seen the arguments, maybe that could influence your mind when considering whether that party deserves an interlocutory injunction to be issued or not in his favor. So I have read Tadiosori's letter to the Chief Justice, mm -hmm. and I noticed, and Tadio is one of the very brilliant guys around, and he indirectly alludes to that uh, argument. There's mm -hmm. a strong argument in that, in, that, in that respect. But because a return date had not been given, mm -hmm. and the AG decided to write to the Chief Justice to demand expedited hearing, professionally, if he had copied the party on the other side, it just shows that he's a fine gentleman. Mm -hmm. If he decides to take them by surprise and then quietly write to the Chief Justice, doesn't he doesn't breach any rule or law, but it's just not fine, mm -hmm. if you ask me. But whether he breached a law, no. So, like I said, this... It's not legally mandatory when there's no return date. Yes for the other party in the case to be notified yes. when there's a, an application for expedited hearing. Yes, and, and that is why so far nobody has shown any specific rule that says that it must be done. Otherwise, I'm sure we would have been shown that by now. But the point really is that, you know, it is in the context of a political tussle mm -hmm. and everybody is maneuvering. And I understand the maneuvering because I cannot deny that I'm, I'm, I'm involved and part of 
the the maneuvering, being mm -hmm. a, a certain member of parliament, mm -hmm. and on the minority side, and it is really because the president has consistently, you know, violated the constitution. Consistently, mm -hmm. it started with the death penalty, you know, uh, prohibition that we passed, mm -hmm. then the witchcraft legislation that we passed, and the president consistently refused to sign these bills after we had passed them and refused to comply with the provisions of Article 106 of the Constitution. That says that if you are not signing, return it to us and tell us why you are not signing. If you need further advice, refer it to the Council of State and get their view on the matter. And then if you have issues with any provisions, highlight those provisions, make your argument why you think those provisions must be changed one way or the other, send it back to us. And we as a parliament, if we feel strongly about it, then we should mobilize two-thirds of our numbers to pass that legislation. Mm -hmm. And once we mobilize two-thirds of our numbers to pass the legislation, you are duty-bound as a president to sign it. Why a president who controls or claims to control a majority of the members of parliament cannot engage in this simple step and then get his side not to vote with the minority, to... To, to make it impossible for us to get the two thirds, which is actually what you should do constitutionally. That's easy. That's easy. That is easy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what is informing the behavior of the president, whether he thinks that he is above the constitution, above the law in this country, and can do as he pleases in such a constitutional democracy. So I may not necessarily agree with people about the legal positions that they take. But in principle, I agree with the fight with the president on this particular matter. That if we don't manage the behavior of this president, he's going to set a very bad precedent for future presidents. Don't forget that this is a democracy and we expect it to endure for centuries to come. Mm -hmm. And once we begin admitting bad behavior by presidents that think that they are above the law and above the constitution, we don't know where they will carry it. Next time, it has to do with the elections. They may change the election date. They may even refuse to hand over when they have lost it, and that kind of thing. So as a country, we must be vigilant because as for democracy, you need to protect it. And you have to protect it because creeping dictatorship, it starts small in areas that you think are really not serious. But once people taste the ability to defy the constitution, and don't get a response from the population, they increase the dose, and they get to a point where the democracy itself will be seriously undermined. So I'm not really very particular about the petty legal niceties. Mm -hmm. Was returned, did there, was returned, did not there. When he wrote the letter, did he copy the Attorney General? Did he not copy the Attorney General? Because in the process of these petty minor debates, we lose the major issue why the fight is going on. Yeah. The fight is going on because Parliament has passed a series of legislation of significant social implications. Why? This country, we have a death penalty legislation. No president has signed that anybody should be executed. So why should we continue having it in our books? So an MP brings a bill. The whole of Parliament goes through the process, spends public money, processes it, agrees on it, votes for it. Presence is our sign. Witchcrafts. Women are being accused falsely of being witches. Some have held been up in witches' mm -hmm. uh, camps. Some have been lynched. Lynched. For years, governments have been pretending that they are doing something about it. And yet the basic legislative framework that will enable you to take firm action has not been present. Parliamentarians sit and say, no, let's take action. Let's take the initiative. We take the initiative. We pass the legislation. People that pretend that they are concerned about witchcraft and then the plight of women who are alleged to be witches refuse to sign the bill. And nobody sees anything wrong with it. Then LGBT bill then comes. And we go through the labor of passing it. The president has a majority of the MPs in that parliament. His MPs join and unanimously vote for it. We send it to him. Then he sits there and writes us a letter to cease and desist even bringing the bill to his uh, presidency. I mean, that level of arrogance, I have never seen it before. I mean, basic modesty would dictate that you receive the letter from a coordinate branch of government. If you disagree, 
basic constitutional law, eh? Constitutional law 101. Yes, 101. You don't even need to get to second year constitutional law no. to understand that there are mechanisms open to you as a president. If you don't agree with it, raise the constitutional issues, mm -hmm. send it back to us. You have resort to the Council of State. Let them lend, them, lend you their support. Send it back to us. Demand that we mobilize to thirds of our numbers. I bet you, if the president is serious, given the hold he has on his MPs in parliament, then this might never be able to mobilize to thirds majority. But he wants to approbate and reprobate. He wants to appear, he and his party, to appear to support the LGBTQ legislation in parliament. And yet, when the bill gets to him at the flagstaff house for him to append his uh, signature, he will find some way he of avoiding it. He said, don't even bring it. Don't, you know, don't, don't even this. bring it to, to, to me. <laughs> so they go out there and tell the churches and then the mosque and the clergy and civil society, oh, we're not even against it all. Don't you see that our MPs voted for it? Did you see our MPs oppose it? Sign it to you and sign it. Yeah. If you receive it, so don't even bring it near me. Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of a game is this? So the petty issues, me, I'm not interested, to be frank with you. And I'm not about to lie for anybody or defend anybody if I'm not convinced about it. But the fundamental issues are there, and I don't want us to lose track of what the fundamental issues are. As for the <coughs> Supreme Court, I think that we should be careful how we relate to the Supreme Court. We should always take our time and look through things carefully. Because, you see, when we destroy the reputation of our Supreme Court, and I'm talking about both the conduct of the judges themselves, is that okay? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And then the conduct of we, the other political actors, if we all behave in ways that destroy the image of the Supreme Court, we will be weakening a very critical element in a functioning democracy, mm. which Injustice. is the ability of a court to hold the balance. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So the court must live above reproach. But at the same time, we those who always walk to them and seek justice must also be careful in the way that we analyze their behavior so that it doesn't destroy that institution. So it's, 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 it's uh, both ways. That's what I can say as an initial take on the matters before you this morning.